Did you know that in developing countries, the survival rate for leukemia patients is almost three times as low as that of developed countries? Now, if you were someone in a developing country and you are experiencing symptoms of leukemia, so you go to your local clinic for a checkup, what might happen is they cannot diagnose you right away due to the lack of trained personnel and expensive equipment. Can you really afford to wait a couple of days for them to send your blood slide over to a larger hospital before getting your results back when a couple of days in leukemia diagnosis could be the difference between life and death? Now, what if I told you that we can have an AI physician? A software that essentially looks at images of leukocytes and uses an algorithm to determine whether or not they are tumorous. That's the concept of computer vision. And in recent years, there's been this really hot thing in machine learning called convolutional neural networks, which essentially use an algorithm to find out exactly what features are the most distinguishing of an image, such as, for example, on a tumorous leukocyte, what shapes and proportions distinguish a tumorous leukocyte from a benign one. Now, I know that sounds a bit like a superpower, but truth to be told, with the amount of data we are generating today, it really is. And I'm going to explain why. So I'm not going to pretend like computer vision didn't exist before this presentation, because it has been there for a very long time, and we have been working on applications such as face detection and optical character recognition. But if I were doing this presentation, let's say, 15 years ago, using traditional computer vision methods, so no convolutional neural networks, no deep learning. Essentially, the way computer vision will work is the human will have to manually define some parameters for the computer to, to look for in the image. So for example, in, in, uh, in a leukocyte image, perhaps the human would say, okay, so look at the threshold for the color. You know, if, if the color uh, raises above this value, and let's say the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio is higher than this, then deem it as a tumorous leukocyte, and otherwise it would be benign. But that's not really how we do things, is it? Forget about leukocytes for a moment. Let's say you go home and your mother comes out to greet you. When you see her face, is your first instinct to go, okay, so I'm gonna have to calculate the distance between her pupils and look at the color of her lips and extrusion of her nose, and if each of these values passes a certain number, then I know she's my mother and not an imposter. No, that would be ridiculous, because the way we process images is very complicated, and images of tumorous blood cells are just as complicated and can't really be defined by a certain set of equations. Now, one idea is to use very complicated, intricate mathematical equations to really dive in there and, and get the most you know, specific attributes that these images may have. Or we can perhaps try using not just one or two or three or four, but 10, 20 different features or properties to classify these images. But the problem we have with those approaches is, is essentially when we're classifying it on so many different features, we are essentially classifying it on, on 20 dimensions or 30 dimensions and we reach the problem called the curse of dimensionality or overfitting. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into it, but essentially when you have so many features, your accuracy actually starts to decrease because you lose, you tend to lose the generalizability of the algorithm. So how do we solve this problem? Because think about it, if we were just using traditional computer vision methods, and we were getting like a 70%, 80% accuracy in classifying tumorous blood cells, would that really work? If you were to go to the hospital and someone told you, okay, so there's about a seven out of 10 chance that you don't have leukemia, but a three out of 10 chance that you do. So if you're feeling lucky today, feel free to go home. No, that would be absolutely terrible. So we need to make sure that this is as, as high as possible, essentially the accuracy is as good as a human pathologist. So in order to do that, we have to employ a method that's not just you know, defining uh, the properties of images down to a simple equation, but instead using 
actually employing the machine itself to learn the features of the image, exactly what are the most distinguishing parts of the image. This is where convolutional neural networks come in. So in convolutional neural networks, there's essentially uh, this thing called a filter. And uh, before I get into this, I just want to make sure that we all understand when an image gets uh, entered into, into the computer, it's, uh, it's translated essentially into a, a matrix, uh, a two-dimensional matrix of values ranging from 0 to 255 uh, based on the intensity because that's, that is the only way that computers can really view the image since uh, they, don't, they don't really see, they can't really only understand numbers and code. So a filter is, you can essentially interpret it as like a window uh, of values that essentially slides across each of the rows and picks out the features that it thinks are, are the most contributing to this image. And it does this a few times, and each time it does this, it gets downsampled, and, and each of these is called a convolutional layer. And at the end, it's going to, it's going to have a result of what class it is classified as. And based on the data, based on the label data, it's going to work backwards. So based on whether it was correct or incorrect, it's going to work backwards and really find out and, and adjust each of these filters. So adjust uh, what features it looks for to really optimize the algorithm and make sure that the features that it, are, it is finding is, is actually the most accurate features that it can use. So this is the gist of convolutional neural networks. And it works very well because if you think about it, you know, if we only did this once or twice or even 10 times, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be that accurate. It would probably just be just finding irrelevant features. But when we're talking about, you know, when we're talking about the scale of hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of images, it can really make wonders happen. Because with this many, with this amount of data, uh, it can really just dive into the deep ends of the image and find out exactly what features are the most contributing to defining this image. So I worked on a project where we used over 50,000 images of acute promyelocytic leukemia uh, leukocytes. So that's a very malignant subtype of acute leukemia. And we were able to achieve an over 99% accuracy in classifying these cells after a lot of reiterations and retrainings, of course. But what impressed me the most is, is not actually just the accuracy, but also when we showed some of these filters, so, so some of the features that the convolutional neural network found to professional pathologists, some of them actually couldn't make sense of what the features were. So they couldn't understand what features it was trying to detect. Because like I mentioned earlier, convolutional neural networks have multiple layers of filters. And really when you get to the later stages, the later layers, it's no longer classifying simple features such as edges and texture but it's really a culmination of all the features that came before it, all the layers, all the filters that come before it. So in a sense, it was classifying an image that, uh, that it morphed for itself, that we don't even know what it looks like. So in a way, we have created a robust robot physician. And you know, when you think about it, it's kind of scary, but at the same time, it's extremely powerful. And for someone at the hospital, it might just save their life. 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are being generated every day. That's 2.5 million terabytes of data every day, which is 2.5 million times my hard drive. And it's not just pictures of blood cells. There's data on how patients with mental illnesses connect with their doctors, how they describe their symptoms. There's data on how drivers react seconds or minutes before their accident. We live in an era where we have unjustifiably more information, technology, machine learning than ever before in human history. And it's all available to everyone, including this kid who doesn't even pay taxes. How will you harness this superpower as we move forward in these unprecedented times.